So we're going to do a little bit of a studio visit here. My studio is in the basement of my home. Fancy, fancy floor, which is MDF, that I put down mostly just to uh, try to save the carpet. But I wanted to highlight it because all of the light blue-gray rectangles are actually from when I was staining the paper for 36 days. So I come into my studio every time and have a quick reminder of my dad and that project. And most of the work actually happens at this uh, sort of drawing table that I've made out of some recycled glass. The drawings that I make are often on 15 inch paper, about that big, um, but will then have leftover pieces um, and that is what I use for more personal or uh, kind of intimately scaled works and things like that. Uh, so we're going to turn on my highly sophisticated uh, lighting system here and continuing with the theme of sophistication my paper tearing uh, system is to tape down a T-square and have a little mark that shows me how big to make the uh, paper. So all of the works in 36 days are 7 inches square. That number was determined in part by frugality. That's the number that um, is left over. But also 7 seemed like a uh, kind of good symbolic number for important themes of life and death. This paper is actually a printmaking paper. And part of the reason for that is that when I was in grad school, it was cheaper than the watercolor paper. And I was broke. So I used this for a series of drawings. And one of the things that was nice about it, other than the fact that it was archival rag paper and a little less expensive, was that I discovered that it actually holds kind of every mark. So you can't really erase on it. It always kind of shows the history of whatever you've done to the paper. Which I kind of liked. I often think of drawings almost as objects or artifacts. When I was an army brat growing up, my family would tour museums. And so when we were in Europe, you'd see these really old objects, the drawings, the prints, the books were not just beautiful as artworks, but also kind of fascinating as documents of time. And so I've continued to use this paper in part because of the way in which it shows sort of every mark. So some of the motivation for working this size for 36 days was, you know, cheapness. I had a lot of this leftover paper, and also it was just an appropriately intimate size, right? Like if you're going to create something that is a memorial to your father, to really talk about family, it makes sense that it's something small, that it can essentially be held in your hand, both when you're making it and after it's done. It's small enough to fit sort of inside your body. It's the size of your heart. Well, maybe not literally, unless you have like terrible health. But it's something that kind of fits inside your chest, and so it made sense that it was that size. Also, I think my tendency to want to use every little scrap of everything is kind of my dad's fault too, in the sense that because we were in the army, 
we moved around a lot. And one of the things that happened when we were moving around a lot is that we had to always make sure that we were under our weight limit for our home goods when we were moving, say, across the country or from America to Germany or something like that. If we had too much stuff, we had to get rid of it. And so after we make the um, pieces the right size, then I'll start to stain them. And part of the idea here is to create a background to react against something that I can work with. This is obviously not the same series because we're dealing with green here instead of the blues. I was deliberately using blue as a sort of somber color of mourning. Essentially, it's layers of really thinned out acrylic paint uh, so that they work a lot like watercolor in the earlier stages and just adding another layer and then adding another layer and then adding another layer. Sometimes uh, by staining with these really old watercolor brushes. These are what are called goat hair brushes. They're really, really soft. So that the water itself and the way it would reacts with the paper can create the surface. Sometimes we'll leave it at that sort of really stained level. And sometimes we'll build it up so that it's um, a more dense acrylic uh, with a more sealed up surface. In the case of the 36 Day series, most of them went pretty far in terms of putting down a color and sanding back through and putting down a color and sanding back through. And that's why so many of the edges of the works themselves have this kind of eroded, uh, weathered feel uh, where corners get nicked or pieces come off. Um, so this, like the other ones, is a printmaking paper that's been stained with acrylic paint enough times to seal up the paint. And what I've done at this stage is lightly with pencil, I'm not even sure if you can see it, drawn in the compositions that are going to be on here. I also start to think about how I'm going to layer the imagery. So this is taking that same pattern dividing it, in this case, across the three panels, and then trying to figure out how I might layer other imagery. One of the things you're probably able to see in the 36 Days series is that there's a kind of commentary that happens where one image, in this case maybe the shell, probably a little easier to see when we translate it into the ink, has an image that is recognizable, that is going to have associations. You're going to look at that and you're going to think about what it means. Um, and then there's going to be something else that sort of comments. A lot of what I was doing with 36 Days was trying to have a linear element, either a diagram or a pattern or some sort of aspect that could comment on the other more recognizable imagery of it, so that it would be not just a scene from the hospital, but also medical diagrams or things from the charts or those kinds of things that were part of the experience. Because when we're looking at back on dad's time in the hospital, it's not just the flashes of memory of the specific instances I think about this particular medication hanging on an IV, but it's also the ramifications of that, the, the kind of ticking down of the dosage or the actuarial tables behind the um, thought process that they were using when they were trying to figure out whether or not they were going to sign things like the uh, uh, living will and that kind of stuff. This particular one um, is about climate change, and so the pattern is intended to be a sort of decorative, abstract version of water waves moving through. Um, what I then got are, because this is also kind of about climate change, we start with a freshwater mollusk, which is an endangered species, and then we're going to move to a, uh, well, you can't really see it there, but the drawing 
I start with pencils so that I can make sure that things are in there right. And you can just barely make out that is a uh, Derwent River sea star, uh, which is interesting in that it is, you know, a starfish, but it's one that lives in a tidal estuary, so it uh, fluctuates between salt and fresh water. And then we get the conch shell, a saltwater uh, animal. And this is the kind of thing that I never really expect anybody to notice, but you can see if I point it out to you that we go from a lighter blue to sort of a medium blue to a slightly darker blue as we're going from fresh water to mixed to salt water. I'm mentioning that partly because I did the same thing in 36 days. If you look at them all in sequence, it actually gets lighter as uh, we go through the series. So we start off with darker blues in 36 days and move to a uh, background that starts to approach white. And part of what I was doing there was trying to kind of represent loss, not only in the individual images, but through the sequence, through all 36 of them, so that there was this element of time and narrative. The way in which the inevitable was um, the conclusion to which we were working. When I was doing 36 days, I started the series after Dad had died, and so I knew that what I was doing was reflecting on an experience that was going to end in his death. You can see that I start with a pencil just to make sure that I get it in there and then we start layering up the ink and what I want you to see is why the background is not just about coming up with a pretty color and a nice surface upon which to work, but the way in which it seals the paper and allows me to manipulate the value of the ink. And what I discovered one time, kind of by accident, is that when I build up the surface so that it's got all that paint on there, I then have an interesting thing happen when I try to draw on top of it with ink, which is that the paint keeps the ink from soaking into the paper. So it sort of sits up on the surface just a little bit longer than it would on bare paper. And that allows me to then come in with an eraser and sort of slide and smooth around so that I can get an effect almost like a wash, but with the control of the pen. I'm using most of the time these Micron, um, you know, plug there, um, Micron pens. They're archival pigment-based inks. They come in a variety of nib sizes so that you can draw with either a really fine line, a slightly larger line that puts down more ink, or something that's big and fat and juicy. So some of the elements that feel a little lighter or more kind of memories, thoughts that are harder to capture are ones that I will draw and then erase back out so that there's still just kind of a whisper of the impression of the image. It's a little bit slower, but then there's a kind of meditative quality to drawing that I appreciate, especially when dealing with a series like 36 Days when you know, I'm still trying to figure out exactly how I do feel about the fact that somebody I love died and the way in which uh, I am reacting to how much of my dad I am but also how frustrated I am with him because he was not taking care of somebody that I love. 
that's what I'm doing right now is just trying to block in the pattern on the conch shell and then I'll come back in probably in another day or two and do more of the kind of work that we're seeing right there where I'm trying to use the hatching to create a sense of volume. This is a little bit flat, but it does have that kind of tiger pattern. And then once I've got that, I can try to use shading um, to create a sense of volume. Um, because I am the nerdy art teacher, I feel obligated to uh, point out that when we're using value to communicate a sense of volume, the fancy pants art term we use for that is chiaroscuro. Chiaroscuro is Italian, you can tell because of the uh. um, So, uh, what we're doing there is using romance languages, which is how we as artists try to appeal to uh, uh, the potential uh, dates. Um, you can woo someone by your romance languages and you seem so elegant and sophisticated. This is what I tell my art students when I'm trying to convince them that the key to successful art career is that they all marry doctors and lawyers. They never seem to think I'm serious about that, which is kind of too bad. I foolishly married for love, but I was smart enough to marry a librarian. So, you know, yay books. Of course, we've got a little bit of a Schrodinger's thing going on here in the sense that your observation of me is changing my behavior because this is not an accurate representation of how I really work in the studio. How I really work in the studio is I don't listen to myself prattling on. I have to spend all day with that guy, and I'm not sure that I especially like him, and he never really has much to say. So what I do when I'm in just execution phase like this, where I've figured out the composition, I've made most of the decisions, and it's really just a matter of spending the time to create the work itself, what I'll do is listen to audiobooks. So being married to a librarian turns out to be a really great idea. A lot of what I wind up doing is listening to uh, really nerdy books so that I can uh, feel like a smart guy. I'm trying to remember if I know what I was listening to when I was working on 36 days. It seems like... <sighs> There was a certain amount of Neil Gaiman in there. Like maybe I was listening to the Graveyard Book, really good book if uh, any of you are interested in mildly spooky, but mostly kind of uh, touching humorous kinds of books. I did a good amount of N.K. Jemison. She recently won the Hugo for her Broken Earth series. It's hard to talk and draw at the same time, as it turns out. 